Grace and peace to you from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus, dear friends. The part of God's Word that we'll look at today comes from Paul's letter to the Galatians, chapter 5. We'll read the first six verses. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm then, and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. Mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. Again, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. For through the Spirit, We eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision has any value. The only thing that counts is faith, expressing itself through love. This is the word of our God. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. That seems like kind of an obvious statement, doesn't it? I mean, did Paul really need to say that? If Christ has set us free from the works of the law, if he has set us free from sin, from death, and from the power of the devil, what else would he have done this for? if not that we might live in and enjoy that freedom. Seems obvious. I mean, imagine a friend saying, it is for fishing that I took you fishing. Okay, I guess that's why we're in the boat in the middle of this lake with all these fishing poles and a bucket of bait. I get it. Or to your spouse, it is for eating that I took you out to eat. Okay, that's why we're in the restaurant. I have a menu in my hand and the waiter is here asking what I want. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. It seems obvious, doesn't it? And yet we need to hear it. Just like the Galatians needed to hear it. Because this freedom that Christ won for us is so often and so easily lost, or abandoned, or forgotten, or disbelieved, or even exchanged again for slavery. The Galatians were in danger of that very thing. And so Paul says to them, stand firm. Do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. He's telling them the freedom that Christ won for you is on the line. And to lose this freedom is to lose everything that matters most of all. First, a little bit of background on the Galatians. Galatia was a Roman province located in Central Asia Minor, present-day Turkey. The cities of Antioch, Iconium, Lystra, and Derbe, they were all included in this province. These are places that the Apostle Paul had visited on his first missionary journey. And then, on his second journey, he returned to visit these same places again. But after he left them that second time, some trouble arose among the congregations in Galatia that prompted Paul to write, this letter. In the opening chapter of this letter, he says, I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. So what went wrong in Galatia? Well, Paul's usual routine on these mission trips was to go to the population centers 
Then he would begin his work at the local Jewish synagogue, if there was one. There he would proclaim the gospel message that we are saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus alone, apart from the works of the law. That's that truth that brings freedom. But inevitably, that liberating gospel message would bring Paul into conflict with many of the Jews at the synagogue who simply couldn't believe that the law of Moses was no longer necessary for salvation. And so Paul would often be expelled from the synagogue, but the work would continue. The Jews who had believed that gospel message would go with Paul and together they would reach out to the Gentiles in that area. Then congregations would be formed. And early on, these congregations would often be under Jewish leadership because those Jewish believers had that background in the Old Testament Scriptures and therefore were able to teach others. And that's essentially how things went in Galatia. But then, as I said before, after his second visit there, trouble arose. Some Jewish teachers, perhaps from Jerusalem itself, came through and started telling the people in these new congregations that what Paul had proclaimed to them was not entirely true. They claimed that in addition to faith in Jesus, people also needed to keep at least some of that Old Testament law, especially circumcision, that sign of the covenant that God had given to Abraham. And so when Paul heard about this, he wrote this letter to the Galatians to warn them that they were in danger of losing that freedom. He was warning them that the lies that these teachers were telling them threatened to bring them back into slavery once again. And so he gave them that strong encouragement. Stand firm and do not let yourselves be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The blood-bought freedom that Christ won for you is on the line, Paul was telling them. To return again, the slavery of the law was not just to give up a little bit of freedom. Ultimately, it would mean they would give up Christ himself and the salvation that he won for them. Paul makes clear how serious the situation really was. He says, mark my words, I, Paul, tell you that if you let yourselves be circumcised, Christ will be of no value to you at all. What is the value of Christ's sacrifice if the words, it is finished, don't mean it is finished? If there is something more that we need to do in order for our salvation to be complete, then Christ is not a Savior. He is at best a helper. Then He is not our only hope. He's only a part of our hope. The rest is left up to us. So much for our freedom. Again, Paul says, I declare to every man who lets himself be circumcised that he is obligated to obey the whole law. Paul is saying, don't think that you can pick and choose which requirements of the law you're going to make necessary for salvation. Now, if you want to approach your relationship with God on the basis of the law, then you have to be all in, not just circumcision, but also the dietary laws, the Sabbath laws, the festivals, the sacrifices, all of it. And if you're not willing or able to keep all of God's law in its entirety, Then what Paul had said earlier in this letter, quoting from the book of Deuteronomy, then it would apply to you. He said, Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. So much for freedom. Paul says, You who are trying to be justified by the law have been alienated from Christ. You have fallen away from grace. These two things don't go together. It's one or the other, Paul is saying. If you want to approach God on the basis of your works, then recognize you are separating yourself from a saving relationship with Jesus. Then you are no longer under God's grace. 
you are only under his law. So much for freedom. It's clear by Paul's words how heartbroken he is over what was happening there in Galatia. He didn't want to see these new believers lose that freedom that they had enjoyed ever since he had first proclaimed the gospel truth to them. So what would he do? What could he do to rescue them? He shares the truth again with them and with us because he knows that that truth is the only thing that can preserve the freedom that Christ won for us. Paul says it like this, Through the Spirit, we eagerly await by faith the righteousness for which we hope. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision nor any other work of the law has any value. The only thing that counts is faith expressing itself through love. The only way to be in a right relationship with God is to accept the righteousness that God Himself gives through Jesus' perfect life and innocent death. And since that righteousness comes in the form of a promise, then the only way for us to receive that is by trusting and believing in the God who made that promise to us. That's why Paul says, the only thing that counts for a right relationship with God or our salvation, the only thing that counts is faith. Yes, that faith expresses itself in love, in works that we do to serve God and to serve our neighbors. But those works are done not in order that we might be saved, but rather out of thanksgiving because we have been saved. That's the truth that brings us freedom. You know, this letter to the Galatians was one of Martin Luther's favorites, if not perhaps his most favorite. He once said about this letter, This is my epistle to which I am betrothed. It is my Katie Von Bora. In case you don't know, that's his wife's name. Luther understood what Paul was saying in this letter. Because the situation that he was facing in his day was so similar to what the Galatians were facing. Yes, Luther, you can continue to talk about Christ and talk about grace, but with the understanding that some works are still necessary for salvation. In fact, Luther probably wouldn't have been bothered much at all if only he had been willing to make a couple of concessions in his ministry. Yes, Luther, you can continue to preach about Christ, but make sure the people understand that they are still subject to the authority of the Pope. Make sure the people understand that they still have to do the prescribed works of penance in order to take care of their sin. Make sure that the people understand that they still need to purchase those indulgences in order to speed themselves and their loved ones along the way that eventually, hopefully, leads to heaven. But if even one single thing is added to what Christ did in order for us to be saved, then our freedom is gone. Then it's no longer grace. And Luther understood that. He took to heart Paul's encouragement to stand firm and not let himself be burdened again by a yoke of slavery. The wonderful truth that God restored to his church through the ministry of Luther and the other reformers, that truth that we are saved by grace alone, through faith in Jesus alone, a truth that we find in the scriptures alone. That's the truth that has brought us the heritage of gospel freedom that we enjoy to the present day. And since we do, then just like Luther, we also want to take Paul's encouragement to heart. We want to stand firm and hold tightly to that precious gospel freedom that we have. 
especially when we consider how all-encompassing that freedom really is. You know, so far we've been discussing how Jesus has set us free from the works of the law in order to be saved. That was the main issue that the Galatians were dealing with. But the freedom that Christ won for us includes so much more than that. I said earlier that to lose that gospel freedom is to lose everything that truly matters. And that is no exaggeration. It is for freedom from sin that Christ has set us free. In our gospel reading today, we heard Jesus say, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. That was true of all of us by nature. By nature, we were under that slavery. By nature, the only thing that we could do on our own was sin. And on our own, we had no way to set ourselves free from that. But Christ came. He took our sin. He paid the wage that we could not and set us free once and for all from sin's ownership. That's what the prophet Jeremiah was announcing in our first lesson today when he talked about the freedom of the new covenant where thanks to Christ, God promises His people that I forgive your wicked and remember your sin no more. Thanks to Christ alone, we are free from sin. It is for freedom from the power of the devil that Christ has set us free. In the book of Revelation, Satan is described as the one who accuses us before God day and night. Satan is the one who comes to us and holds up our sins in our faces and says, See, there is no way you could ever be in a close relationship with the Holy God. Just look at the things that you've done. Satan is the one who stirs up that lie in our hearts that there's something that we must do to make up for these sins. When those sins are weighing on us, when we're feeling the shame and the guilt and the burden of it all, Satan is right there to try and crush us in despair. But because of Jesus' atoning sacrifice for our sin, Satan's words are now empty. The righteousness that we have by faith shields us from all of his accusations, shields us from his condemnation. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul asks this question, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen? The answer is no one. Not even Satan. Thanks to Christ alone, we are free from his tyranny. It is for freedom from death that Christ has set us free. That last enemy wants us to believe that it's the bitter end. It wants us to believe that our loved ones who have died are gone forever. But Jesus came and put this enemy into submission as well when he rose from the dead. In doing so, he set us free from the fear of death ourselves. And also, When a loved one dies in the Lord, he set us free from having to grieve like the rest of people in this world who have no hope. We're free from death. Nowhere is that truth on greater display than when God's people gather for a funeral. It doesn't matter if it's the funeral of somebody who's lived to a ripe old age and we were expecting their death. Or if it's a tragic death, a young man, unexpected. There's going to be tears. There's going to be grief. Sometimes more than we could ever imagine. And yet above all, there's hope. Hope of a resurrection. Hope of a reunion. Hope that springs from the freedom that Christ won for us. Thanks to Christ alone. We are free even from death. It is for freedom that Christ has set us free. There's nothing that matters more than that. But remember where it comes from. 
that freedom springs from the truth of the gospel. And so that takes us back to Jesus' words in our gospel today. Remember what he said. If you hold to my teaching, if you hold to the whole revelation of God's grace that I've given in my word, then you will know the truth. The truth that Jesus came, that he lived perfectly, that he died innocently, that he rose victoriously, that he reigns eternally, all for you. Then you will know the truth. By faith you will know Jesus himself who took your place in life and death so that you could belong to him in both life and death. When you know that truth, the gospel of your forgiveness, when you know Jesus himself, then the truth will set you free. And that truth will keep you free forever. Amen. And may the peace of God which surpasses all understanding guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Amen.